Hello. Welcome to this episode of a Creative Approach podcast. I'm your host, Karen Poirier Brody. Thank you for listening. I finished that summer school class that I talked about in a previous episode. It's giving me a little more time to get some things done around here, but it does not seem to be enough time. That's the problem with being retired. Not enough structure in my day. I think I need to get a planner. They look so pretty. I could use up a lot of scrapbook supplies decorating one. That seems like it might take up some of the time I want to find. Hmm. Do you use a planner? Has it been helpful? Are you more productive? Join the A Creative Approach podcast Facebook group page and let me know in the comments. I want to recommend a visit to our website, www.acreativeapproachpodcast.com, where you will be able to access show notes from today's episode and our past programs. I also want to thank my Patreon members for their support. My guest today is William Doonan. Bill is an archaeologist, anthropologist, professor, and author. I first got to know him from a summer school session in cultural anthropology at Sacramento City College. He was one of the best teachers I've ever had, and when his forensic anthropology class opened, I enrolled. I learned so much. Bill is a wonderful communicator. He has a terrific sense of humor. I know you'll enjoy his story. Please listen now as we welcome Bill Doonan and learn about his creative approach. Today, I'm really happy, I mean very happy, to welcome (laughs) Professor William Noonan, Bill, uh, to my podcast. Hi. Hi, Karen. Thanks for having me. It's great to have you. Now, I know because I took two of his classes at Sacramento City College and found him to be a real entertaining professor. And then he told me or told the class about his books and I read his books and enjoyed them. They're really interesting characters. And so I thought he'd be a perfect guest to talk about creativity. So I think I gave a very brief outline here of what you did, but I was wondering if you could just elaborate on that of what it is you do. Well, let's see. I'm an archaeologist. And I teach anthropology and archaeology at Sacramento City College, as you know, and forensic anthropology as well, which I think you, you had taken. So this is, I'm about to start my 19th year at Sacramento City College. I love it there. It's a wonderful place. And in the summer times, I lecture on cruise ships. I'm sort of a cruise ship entertainer. So I give lectures. It's a little bit history, a little bit of archaeology, a little stand-up comedy, and a little here's what we can expect when we get to our next port. And I've been doing that for 16 years or so. In fact, we just got back from a series of cruises up in the Baltic and the North Sea. We spent some time in Russia and Norway and Iceland. And I bring my whole family, so it's really been a wonderful experience. And so having worked on cruise ships for so long, I started paying a lot of attention to cruise ship culture and the sort of different worlds that coexist on cruise ships between the passengers and the crew and such. And then I started paying attention to this kind of nebulous realm, this kind of almost lawless realm that some cruise ships operate in. Like, what if there is a crime at sea? What if there is a something that happens? You're technically not in anyone's jurisdiction. And so that's where I got my, my idea for writing my Henry Grave mystery novel series about a octogenarian detective who solves crimes on cruise ships. <laughs> and he's a funny character. <laughs> I love him. I love him. You know, a lot of people who are on cruise ships can be on the older side. And so I've met a lot of really kind of wonderful senior people. At one point a couple years ago, I was with my boys up on deck, and this older man came and started talking to me and said, uh, the thing with boys, you have to be really careful. You can't let them go in the Army. And I thought, well, you know, they're five and three, so that's not going to happen soon. But he was like, no, no, it's really important. And he said, started looking at his scars, and he goes, I got this one in Normandy. And, and I realized, wow, I'm talking to a German soldier in World War II that I've just met on a cruise ship. And so you meet some really fascinating people. Oh, wow. So that's how I started getting into that. And I've written four books in that series, and that's been a lot of fun. A couple of years ago, they were optioned for a TV series, but it didn't know we picked it up. There was some concern that people weren't ready for an, an older TV protagonist. I thought, <laughs> Come on, what about Matlock? What about Jessica Fletcher? I think there's some room out there, especially <laughs> given you know an aging demographic. I think we could make it work. So I'm still keeping my fingers crossed, and we'll see what happens as, as far as that goes. 
<laughs> uh, you know, and he's such a funny character. Thanks. <laughs> I think that could be played really well. People would find that very entertaining. Hmm. Well, good luck with that. That sounds very well, interesting. You. So, and then as far as teaching, you kind of bring a little bit of your imagination into the classroom. I remember it was just always fun to see what you'd dream up next in the next class. Well, I think there's a, a couple of reasons for that. First, like I have to have fun too, otherwise I'm not going to enjoy it. And I think people learn better when they're engaged and, and when they can find that this is not some dry, horrible material that they're dealing with, but it's vivid and it's live and it can be fun. And I think that makes a lot of difference. I think it helps with retention a bit as well. I've always thought that the best teachers should be entertainers, so that worked well into my philosophy. <laughs> right, right. <That's laughs> and. Right. As far as actual work in the field in archaeology, you've done some of that, right? Yeah, I have young children now, so I'm sort of grounded. But prior to the children, I spent about a decade working for part of the year, at least, in Costa Rica, doing some work down there. I did my doctoral dissertation work in Copan. It's a Maya city in western Honduras. They're looking at stone tools and excavating a palace complex that belonged to the last king of Copan. And that was a blast. And then right before my children arrived on the scene, I'd worked five summers in coastal Peru looking at Moche pyramids, these mud brick pyramids that this culture called Moche built on the Pacific coast. And it was really fascinating, and I'd love to do some more of it. There's a, a lot that we don't know still out there that needs getting looked at, and that's certainly part of that puzzle. Yeah, and... I think that's really interesting. I mean, you brought some of that into the classroom, and then I saw that you had graduated with your bachelor's from Brown, and I had taken an online class at Coursera on archaeology from Brown University. That was really fun. <laughs> and they sort of took us around the world to a couple of the places people from the university were working, so got videos from places. Right. And that was very interesting and engaging. So, yeah, I have all kinds of interests, so <laughs> that was one that, that was... I recall that about you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now... I guess one of the things with all of your interests is I'm kind of wondering how you got there. I mean, where were you born and did you have family that were into these sort of pursuits? Where did this all happen? All right. Well, let's see. I was born in New York City. I grew up in New Jersey, so I'm an East Coaster. My parents were both teachers. My dad was a high school English teacher in New York City and my mom was a college administrator. When I was nine, we moved to Puerto Rico for three years. So I spent three years going to school in Puerto Rico. And, you know, when you're nine and 10 and that kind of age, language acquisition comes really easily to you. So I kind of became fluent in Spanish before I hit that cutoff year, which makes it more difficult. And so, so that helped. And we moved back. I had a moved back to New Jersey. I had a seventh grade teacher that was an archaeologist. She gave an archaeology unit in, in seventh grade. And that summer, we went to Coster, went to Coster, Illinois, to do a field work. So I was in seventh grade doing actual field archaeology, and Ooh. I absolutely hated it because it was hot <laughs> and there were bees, and you were just digging down just a little bit at a time. And I found it insanely, insanely boring. <laughs> and the insects and dust would have got to me. <laughs> they did, they did, they did. Uh... But something about it kind of stuck with me. And then I got to college, I started paying a lot of attention to anthropology. And I figured this is, you know, as much as it was a little bit uncomfortable, it's still calling to me. So I spent some time working on that. And then you know, I did a, a BA in, in anthropology. And that summer, I joined one of my Brown professors, a guy named Richard Gould, in Bermuda doing shipwreck archaeology, some nautical archaeology on an ironclad warship that had been sunk there intentionally, actually, to block a channel. And I thought, wow, this is great archaeology. There's no bugs underwater. <laughs> it's not as hot. And you could basically dive all day long in Bermuda, which is beautiful. And I was like, well, this is this is the way to go. And I never got another opportunity like that again. But I worked after college at Earthwatch, which is a science research funding facility in, in Boston, where we got to kind of organize and manage the funding and staffing end of a lot of science projects. So I had a lot of exposure to archaeology projects there. I managed the archaeology program after a time there. And I decided I wanted to go to grad school and actually do this. So I did. I went to Tulane University in, in New Orleans. And I basically started looking at essentially my archaeology. I'd always been interested in Costa Rica. And I always spent some time in Costa Rica, but I did a lot of my archaeology. And that's ultimately what I did my, my dissertation on and resulted in a, a book on my artifacts from Copan, which I was really, really proud of. 
which they published a few years ago at Middle American Research Institute. Oh. So that was a lot of fun. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. And so I'll get back to it. Um, <laughs> in the meantime, you know, since I have family obligations, I've sort of kind of switched tasks a little bit. I've become very interested in Irish language revitalization. So we did a sabbatical in Ireland a few years ago looking at how the Irish are trying to take back their language and kind of have more people speak it and feel proud of the native language. So I've been studying the language for about six years. I could speak about it as well as an Irish baby now. I've been doing that, yeah, and... And so that, that's been keeping me kind of kind of nicely occupied. That seems like a difficult language. I mean, I was just in, I spent a couple, well, over a week in Ireland just a couple months ago. Beautiful country, great place to have to go and do some research. <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I fascinating. Started, uh, yeah, I thought this language isn't so bad. I'm like, the word for cat. I'm like, okay, it's cat. I'm like, I can do that. <laughs> and then dog is madra, M-A-D-R-A. And I thought, okay, that's, that's just another word. That's okay. And then window is inog, which is F-U-I-N-N-E-O-G-H or something like that. And I'm like, this is awful. <laughs> well, but they have about 72,000 native speakers right now, and that's critically low for language survival. So I'm going to do what I can to make sure that that language doesn't become extinct. That's oh, my goal. Fantastic. No, that's great. And so you have Irish roots. I do. I do. Uh, did your family come over during like the potato famine, or do you know anything about your genealogy? I was wondering as an uh, archaeologist. I sure do. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So on my mother's side, her father's family came over probably a little bit before the potato famine. So my grand, my maternal grandparents, a little bit, little bit after that. And on my father's side, it was early 20th century that they came over. So not exactly, but we, I've been back to visit. I've been back to visit relatives several times. I trace my genealogy. I have an Irish passport. I have Irish passports for my children. So when the, you know, if the apocalypse comes, we're going to Dublin and living on the dole. You know, if the teacher <laughs> doesn't work out, you can get that to fall back on. So, yeah, it's been um, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> that is funny. <laughs> well, a beautiful country and a great country to have as a backup. It's nice. I think, you know, America is a wonderful melting pot of things. You know, I bring to it my Canadian background, which already is a melting pot, but right. <laughs> diverse cultures already, although right. I have traced my family back in many ways because genealogy is, of course, yet another one of those yeah, interests. Another hobby. <laughs> right. Indeed. <laughs> Too many of them. I like them. it. Yeah, it keeps us busy, though. Maybe we stay out of trouble that way. I don't know, Bill. <laughs> it does, it does. Now, when it came to, well, obviously teaching, once you get a graduate degree, that is a place where people can go, and you had that background from your parents that mm -hmm. you didn't think that was necessarily so bad a life. <laughs> and, I thought uh, it was a wonderful life. This is the holy grail of all vacation packages. We have four <laughs> months off a year. I, I love that. <laughs> We've been traveling every summer. I, mean, mm. I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah, it does sound like fun. And you have a rewarding career. But then, you know, I guess, how is it that you got into cruise ships? Well, interesting story. So my, I think it was my first or second semester at Sac City College. I was teaching an honors archaeology class. One of the fellows, another teacher named Bruce Perini, had arranged for the silverback archaeologist to come give a talk. His name was Brian Fagan, and I had studied Brian Fagan's books as an undergrad and as a graduate student, and I was really thrilled that Brian Fagan was coming to campus. He's this older English guy, and he's super nice. And so he gave this talk, which was interesting, and they had also arranged for people to sign up to have lunch with Brian Fagan, and nobody signed up. And so they asked me if me and my honors class would like to have lunch with them. And I was like, sure, we'll do that instead of class today. Hey, you don't get this opportunity all the time, right? So we had a, a really nice lunch with, with uh, Brian Fagan. And at the end of which, he says, he leans over, he goes, what are you doing this summer? And I was like, well, I, I don't know why. He goes, I have this opportunity that I can't do it. And it's working on a cruise ship, giving lectures in Greece and in Egypt and in Turkey. Would you be in? I'm like, yeah, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. He goes, well, it leaves in two weeks. And I was like, I'm there. And so I put some material together and spent three weeks on board uh, Olympic Voyager, sailing between you know Egypt and Turkey and Greece, and giving these lectures on these ports, which was more or less archaeological lectures, which I've been doing anyway, and so that worked well. And so because I was sort of a last-minute replacement, I didn't go through any background checks or anything at all, no auditions or anything, and I sort of kind of got in through the back door, and then the agent that represented Brian Fagan then took me on, and so we worked for a while after. 
Olympic, I guess it was Olympic Cruise Line went bankrupt. I don't think I had anything to do with that. And then I started working <laughs> for Crystal Cruises for years. And then more recently, the past three years, we've been working with Disney, which my children love. They oh, yeah. would never want to go on another cruise ship now. So oh. I've had a wonderful time. Yeah, it's a nice way to travel with young children. My wife enjoys it. And you know, it's been kind of something that I fell into and felt really, feel really lucky about. Yeah, well, I like taking the occasional cruise. I've got one coming up in a little while with some friends, which should be fun because we've usually just taken the cruise with ourselves and we brought our son once. But we actually have a whole group of friends who are going to go together, which is kind of cool. But, yeah, I've gone to some lectures on some ships and found out interesting things. Do you? It is a captive audience. <laughs> but <laughs> It is. It is. Uh, it but is. That's kind of like the classroom. <laughs> Right. I have you now for a little bit of time, so you may as well enjoy yourself. (laughs) And you have a gift of comedy that is very good. I always loved the characters in forensic anthropology. They were always the same (laughs) celebrity photos, but they all had uh, unique personalities every week. (laughs) How much clip art was I really going to pay for? You know, (laughs) use the same characters. Of course, of course. But that was always fun. And was it just that somebody had to teach forensic anthropology or was that a particular interest of yours? No, somebody didn't have to teach it. We'd never had those classes before, so I wrote the curriculum for it. It's it's pretty commonly done on different college campuses, and I think it's an interesting class because it's sort of like much of anthropology. It, it sort of transcends the sciences as part physical science because you're dealing with raw osteology and studying bones, and you need to have that knowledge in order to do that. But at another level, it's very much a, a cultural class because uh, we're looking at uh, cultural pathology, which is murder and suicide. And these are social pathologies that are not part of a physical anthropological world. So I enjoy that. It, it, it kind of helps us understand our culture at some ways at its very worst. I mean, we're talking about people getting killed. And that's a really kind of interesting place to learn about your own culture. That's an unfortunate place, but it's an interesting place as well. And I try to make it apparent to students uh, some of the things that I learned in graduate school. Like, you know, we're dealing with skeletons. So when I was in in graduate school, we all had a skeleton that we brought home for the semester so that we'd become involved with learning all the names and such. And my professor was very adamant about this one point. It's like, you know, be respectful and you never give your skeleton a name. Never. And the reason is because that's a person. It already has a name. It might be an unidentified person. We don't know who this is, but this is a dead person. So they already have a name, and they're still wrapped up, perhaps, in the social fabric that recognizes them. There might be some people out there who are still wondering what happened to them. So it's, it's that kind of respect that I think is important to bring to an anthropology class and try to get that across. Yeah, I think, well, of course, that's very important. I mean, you know, as medical students, we always had to deal with cadavers and anatomy. Right, right. And understand that. I mean, that, you know, have we deal with bones and some of them are, well, of course, a lot now are plastic casts of real bones. They are. But they're still very (laughs) bone-like. And uh, it was always uh, interesting to work in a group and try and figure out these questions of... uh, Age and sex and other and race and things that you can determine from bones. And of course, That's it's right. more interesting right. now when people can dig out the teeniest little pieces of DNA and stuff and really be able to investigate things more thoroughly. I always That's find that right. fascinating. That's right. yeah. yeah, it's With definitely that. true. Yeah. But just a little bit of knowledge, like I tell my students, if you were to go to grad school in forensic anthropology, sure, you would learn more about the DNA aspect, but most of what you would be learning is simply more of what we did in class. It's like determining ancestry, sex, height, and such. This is very important, and you develop a technical expertise with it, and and that's what's important when you investigate murders. I mean, a lot of places around the world, and certainly even the country, don't have all of the, don't have the resources to do some kind of complex type of studies that you see on shows like the CSIs and such, and not all of that is even real. So being able to do the down and dirty kind of basics, I think, is is vitally important. And I think it's interesting for students to see that what they're doing, what we were doing in that class is exactly what you'd be doing in grad school. You just do far more experience within far more repetitions of each task. But that's the material that forensic anthropologists pay attention to. And I think that was interesting for me. That's what got me excited. And and I think that 
looking at that class in the first place. Yeah, and there are some real subtle things, but of course, if as you work at it and practice at it, I'm sure that comes pretty easily for people who get into that field. Although it's a pretty s- narrow field, I mean, thank God. <laughs> that it is, right. Called, right. People aren't called upon that often to have to solve these mysteries at that point, but yeah. Still too often, though. Oh, that's too often. true, and unfortunately... In countries like where there's some really bad things going on, like in South America, for instance, there's a mass graves and things like that. I'm sure right. there's a whole lot of things to be concerned about there that forensic anthropologists can add to. But, of course, I guess it's risky for them, too, to investigate. Right. It surely yeah. can be. Yeah. And you teach cultural anthropology. Now, as I recall, when I was in the class, it was a cultural study in the class itself. We had a real eclectic group. Uh (laughs) That made it fascinating, I think, when you have a real interesting group of people who bring a lot of cultures to class. And then you start talking about different cultures. It becomes a richer experience. You, you can't pick a better place to teach cultural anthropology than Sacramento. I mean, it's extraordinary. Think about how many different cultures we have represented on our campus. And sitting in class, you know, I start talking one day about shamanism, and you'll have four students who, you know, some of them are Hmong, some of them are elsewhere. And they can talk about shamans in their own family. And I didn't get that in going to school in Rhode Island. You know, <laughs> so this is, this is something I feel very lucky about. We have this this multiculturalism that really almost lets the subject teach itself, which I'm I'm extremely grateful for. Yeah, well, I did notice that. And yeah, City College, of all the campuses even here in the Sacramento area that are part of our community college group or even our more advanced educational groups like the State College and University right. of California, I think City College is certainly one of the hugest campuses around and a really diverse population. It is, and and not just in terms of culture, also in terms of age as well. I mean, one of my closest friends in Sacramento is this woman who took a class with me my first year, and she was 70 then when she took it. And and you have people from all different ages and all different backgrounds coming here, and I think that makes it wonderful. I mean, having some 18-year-old sit in a class and having the same kind of classroom experience to some extent with somebody who is a senior citizen who has a very different background, a very different sort of experience, I think that makes the class all the richer. It surely does for me. Yeah, well, it it is fun. Well, I just took a summer school class at City College. In it's a journalism communications class. Oh, right uh, on. on. I took it on mass media and society, which kind of worked right, right into <laughs> things. But of course, I had all this life experience about you know you growing did. up yeah. with things that changed with the mass media. So uh, <laughs> I was very familiar with some of the issues and questions she brought up, <laughs> probably more so than the there teacher. <laughs> But that maybe so, maybe so. Yeah. So as far as the books, now, what made you, I guess, because you're investigating things in anthropology, is that why you gravitated to mystery or uh, it just seemed interest? You said something like, I guess, this kind of world of no particular law on a ship was what intrigued you. Is that? I think it's a couple of things. I've always been interested in creative writing and I've always wanted to I love the idea of just kind of going off and starting to create these worlds. It's it's my own hinterland where no one else has any say, you know, and I can kind of freely roam in there. So I enjoy that aspect of it. And then I, you know, think about like, you know, what would happen? Why is there nothing that happens at sea? What would happen? And a lot of these cruise ships have quite sophisticated security apparatus on board. I mean, they have to because if somebody mm-hmm. does kill somebody or there is an accident, and there is, there was just an incident last week of a man who killed his wife on board a ship. I think it was up in Alaska. And in that case, all right, you're in Alaska, you're in U.S. territorial waters. That's an American issue. That's FBI probably right there. But what if you're out at sea? There technically is not an effective jurisdiction. And so the ships get around it by having, you know, their fairly robust security force that's largely invisible to the passengers. You're not going to see the inside of a holding cell unless you really need to see the inside of a holding cell. But they have security officers, too. Right. A lot of them are these, like, they hire very often, like, these Nepalese ex-military guys, special forces from Nepal, because they're, you know, they're tiny little guys, so they don't seem very intimidating, but they're deadly, and they speak fluent English, so they're kind of like, a a lot of the time, that's the security people you see on, on ships. 
it's nice to know there's good security, but... Yeah, I was sitting up in one of the lounges between cruises one time, and these, all these people started coming in. And it wasn't just the security people. It was like the wait staff and everybody, and they started looking under the tables and looking under the chairs. And I was sitting there kind of right in my next lecture. There wasn't really too many passengers on board. And I was like, what are you, are you doing? And they're like, well, we're looking for something. I was like, well, what is it? And they're like, well, it's okay. I was like, can I help? And they're like, no, what are you looking for? And finally, the guy's like, a, a bomb. And I'm like, really? Is, is this something I should know about? And they're like, no, no, it's a drill. It's a drill that we do, you know. And so there's a lot of things they have to be paying attention to. Yeah, well, like any security, but you're right. It's a very confined place. and It and is, right? There's a whole lot of people. I mean, most ships nowadays, I don't know what, you must have some idea what the average ship size as far as passengers. Awesome. And then they have all over the place. And they have an equal number of staff, I think, to passengers almost, don't they? Maybe not quite. I mean, the, the ships that I've been mostly working on are in the 2,000-person the range, but some of the largest ones, like the, what is it, Emerald of the Seas, or some of them have more than six, 7,000 passengers, which is, there's like Pacific nations that size. It's crazy. <laughs> it's a, I do not understand how something like that floats. It's ridiculous. I suspect they're actually walking on the seafloor with giant sort of, sort of legs. <laughs> yeah, you wonder. They are pretty massive. <laughs> Yeah, interesting conjecture. Well, one thing I did notice is anthropology does work its way into your books. It does. I love anthropology. I've been doing this for a long time, and it's it's really great. I couldn't imagine teaching anything else. I wouldn't mind teaching. You know, it'd be nice to teach writing or something like that, but I don't have the background in it. But, uh, you know, I prefer this to studying math. Or Every day there's something new in anthropology, and there's new finds, and there's new discoveries in them. I'm fascinated by that. You're right, as far as new things all the time, because it pops up all the time, and and I zoom into those stories. Of course, my fascination, I think, tends to go towards Egypt. I don't know why. Is that right? (laughs) I think it was a third grade experience (laughs) that left an indelible mark in my mind that this was so cool. (laughs) Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I remember looking at that image of... Uh, Howard Carter peering into King Tut's grave saying, I see wonderful things. And I'm like, that must be extraordinary. That will be all right. So I think that gets a lot of people interested in, in archaeology. Yeah. As did the close Raiders of the Lost Ark. I think a whole generation of archaeologists came out of that. But usually it isn't like that. It's very rarely do you find haunted artifacts and <laughs> demonic. I must say, I do have a little interest, too, of course, of North American stuff, because I have some Native American background. And so some of the stuff related to Native American cultures in North America is of particular interest to me because of that. Any little finding about those sorts of things is interesting. And also how, you know, one of the things I took in a different anthropological class, of course, was, you know, learning about sort of the anthropological origins and how people, you know, moved out of Africa or moved across America. And so some of that is, I think, pretty fascinating. Now, I guess, you know, in all of these things, you well, you don't have the background in like teaching English and stuff as far as the writing, because obviously you have practical experience <laughs> in teaching that subject. I do. And, and you know, I, I give papers in my class, so I get into that a little bit. But I love the fiction writing aspect of it. But I have time for this. I try to weave time for this in my summers and, and office hours if nobody shows up. <laughs> so, yeah, <laughs> of course they probably I'm do. not complaining. No. Now, I was just going to talk about it because, you know, the whole premise of my the podcast show here now is the creative approach. And, and so I was thinking, you know, things about what does creativity mean to you and, and how, you know, with your students and stuff, I mean, are you trying to inspire their interest? But how about, you know, developing their ideas and creativity within them? Do you have some thoughts on that? I would like for students to be more comfortable understanding that it's okay to question the world. And I like when they come to the class with some kind of notions about issues like race and issues of sexuality. And at the end, they're like, wow, that's, you know, it's, it's more complex than, than I had imagined. And I think that can help broaden them a little bit to the extent that that will make them more creative. I'm not sure, but I, I hope it will make them more confident. And I think one of the things we focus on in cultural anthropology is you're going to do the same things as anyone else in the world because you're human. So by the end of the course, at the end of the semester, 
having examined cultures and looked at videos of people in South America and Africa and Europe, I think people, their students hopefully come to the conclusion that we're sort of all in this together and we're fairly predictable at a species at some level. And if you can understand that predictability, and if you can understand how systems like food production and economics and politics are sort of linked together, and if you understand those systems, you can kind of understand what your art's going to look like, what your songs are going to look like. It kind of I think a little bit puts it all into place. And so you can, if you get to the point where you can say, all right, I know you're a hunter-gatherer culture in, in the middle of, in middle of Africa. Now I can predict what your economic reality is, what your political reality is, what your songs are going to sound like, what your paintings are going to look like. It helps us be, I think, more comfortable as humans, maybe more inclusive. And you have a sense, it's like now the whole world is kind of, part of me. So now if you if I have a student that did want to write a story about somebody living in Australia, they would understand, well, here's some things I can know about them, about these people, just because I'm human, because I know how humans work. I think that can be valuable. Now, do you think there's any lessons, you know, as we develop our little, what the term is about the little bubbles we develop as a part of uh, social media now, or we only listen to people who are just like us. <laughs> are there any answers that you can see in that that would help us as a country? You know, that's a tough or nut to crack. I mean, you know, when I, I pull on Facebook and I see only stories that I completely agree with at this point, so that's not hugely helpful. I think it's really important in order to in order to do anything about that we got to be reading a lot of newspapers and paying attention really kind of paying attention to a lot that's going on because there's so much going on right now that it's almost impossible to to kind of wade through all of the differing viewpoints but almost impossible isn't good enough because you still have to do it so you have to maybe that's where the creative comes in a creative listener a creative reader to try to delve through everything we're looking at to find out what's really going on yeah i think that's true yeah, we, obviously, some of this just seems a little scary <laughs> to me, but it does. As you said, we have to understand others and understand things, but sometimes I just find it hard to understand something, <laughs> which is alarming. I agree. Yeah, I agree. but I think we have to keep trying. That is important. I don't think we have a choice. We no, don't have a choice. Obviously, <laughs> obviously not. Well, it's really been fun talking to you, Bill. I don't know if well, you as well, Karen. Final thoughts that you had here today, but I've really enjoyed this. Well, I've enjoyed it as well. Well, what I wanted to do though was, first of all, we have to maybe tell people some of the names of your books and how they they can certainly find them on Amazon, right? They can sure find them on Amazon, absolutely. And you know, they're indexed any bookstore. I don't know if they'll be in a lot of bookstores, but they can order them for you because they're all indexed. So the books we had been talking about, featuring my detective Henry Grave, I have four of them. I'm starting with Grave Passage, which I published in 2009. Um, you can find all the information about me at my website. It's www.williamdoonan.com, D-O-O-N-A-N. And it'll give you a sense of kind of what I pay attention to these days. Well, that's great. Well, once again, thanks very much for joining me today. Well, thank you, Karen. It's been nice talking with you. Lovely to talk with you, too. Thanks so much for listening to a Creative Approach podcast. I hope you subscribe to the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. Please check out our Creative Approach podcast Facebook page, where I keep you up to date on our latest episodes. Do check out the podcast website, www.acreativeapproach.com. At the site, you'll find a resources tab where some of my favorite products are listed. I may receive some income from affiliate memberships of those products. You can be assured that these are brands and products I use and enjoy. Just a reminder that a Creative Approach podcast website features a Patreon page tab, which has some photos and updates and gives an opportunity for those who want to offer some monetary support for the program. I'll talk to you again with another interesting guest on the next episode and sign off now with best wishes in your Creative Approach to Life. <music>